We need one, I think. As opposed to in layperson's terms. <laughs> we like to uh, we like to continue our meeting, but I like before we start, I like to call Mr. James Graham. When James did his presentation, I didn't ask my colleague on committee if they have any question for James, and he had. Uh, ask if any question from my colleague about his presentation, because I didn't give him the opportunity when he was here earlier. Any question from Mr. Graham? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Graham, but I'm glad you asked me about this. Uh, next speaker, we have Rosie McNeese. Oh, Rosie, she's right here. I'm ready to go. Chairman and members of the <coughs> Iraq Committee. Can you hear okay? <laughs> okay? Good afternoon. My name is Rosie McNeese. I've lived in cars for over 30 years. We live about uh, two kilometers away from the 416 and Roger Stevens on the east side of the highway. My husband and I have a small farm alongside Stevens Creek. I work on the land and for many years have done a lot of horseback riding on the land right across the highway from the proposed site. In fact, sometimes we ride right across Roger Stevens Drive. Uh, so I know the area very well. I have two important points to make. My first point, and one that I noticed was not included in your list of issues, um, I support valid and realistic studies. However, as the previous speaker, Bruce, pointed out, the EIS submitted by Mancaster Environmental Planning to Broccolini included with the proposal to build the warehouse is clearly insufficient. Knowing the land so well, directly across the highway from the proposed site, I know that displacing all living life from a large portion of rural site will create a major loss of habitat for many different species of our native wildlife, birds, plants, and insects some of which I actually see when I'm riding some of these species at risk, I see when I'm riding the bobolink, barn swallows. Traumatic decimation of their dens, nests, shelters, food caches for the winter will result in wildlife freezing or starving to death, and at other times of year, there will be roadkill, increased roadkill, orphaned offspring, and injured wildlife. There is no recommend, recommendation made in Moncaster's EIS to abide by the city's handbook, Protocol for Wildlife Protection During Construction. And I have a copy with me here. Um, and I would suggest for any development on this site, following this guideline should be a mandatory requirement and rigorously followed and monitored. Remember, this is a rural area which has been home for many, many years to many different species. Is it acceptable to turn a blind eye to their eviction and suffering for our economic growth? Already half of Canada's wildlife species are in serious decline. And I have the backups here. Um, my second point, as has been um, referred to already, Ottawa City Council declared a climate emergency for the purposes of deepening its commitment in protecting our ecosystems and our community from climate change. Council has also adopted a long-term community target of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 80% below 2012 levels by 2050. Looking at this proposal to build a mega warehouse with 63 truck bays in a rural area, no public transit, no city services, increased carbon imprint, bringing its own air, light, and noise pollution, encouraging urban industrial stroll to spread into the rural area. Everything about this proposal is contrary to the city's declaration of a climate emergency 
and the city's stated targets for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. As one of your <coughs> councillors, Councillor Eagli, said back in April, if the kids and our youth are telling us things need to be done, I think we should listen to them. Yes, we should. Life will change drastically in the next, for, them, in, for them in the next 15 or 20 years. Economic growth may longer, no longer be the driver. We need to consider whether the benefits of this type of develop, development in an agricultural area for the short term being tax dollars and a handful of minimum wage jobs are outweighed by the harm that such projects cause to our communities, our wildlife, the rural landscape, and the people who live there now, who are trying to steward that land for future generations, their children and their grandchildren. The city of Ottawa has committed in its document <coughs> on intensification you have 30 second, Rosie. <laughs> to stop urban sprawl. Do your own statements mean nothing? In closing, as our councillors and as members of the Agriculture Rural Affairs Committee, we would like you to be able to sincerely look your children and grandchildren in the eyes and say you have done everything possible to preserve our environment and the rural part of the Ottawa city, Ottawa, city of Ottawa's way of life. Thank you for the opportunity to express my concerns. Thank you very much, Rose. Any question for the delegate? No, thank you. And you're getting a big wave behind me. <laughs> Uh, next speaker is uh, Gordon, Gordon uh, Kubenek. Good afternoon, sir. I'm just going to throw something up. PC. Try that one. Oh, is this your, you're on it? Oh, you found it. Okay. Are you ready, Gord? Yes, I'm ready now. Thank All you right, very much. Sir. We'll start the clock. Uh, uh, my ahead. name is Gordon Kubinek. I'm a professional engineer, Green Party candidate, and I've lived in the village of Cars for the past 16 years on First Line Road. Um, I'm going to focus uh, primarily on the chunk of land in the middle of the property. Um, it is a recharge zone, and under the current zoning, it is not to be built on or developed as it currently stands. Um, I'm going to mention a little bit about the uh, supporting the land use supporting the farm community secondarily. Uh, the central zone of this land has been identified in the 2018 Mississippi Rideau Source Protection Plan as being part of a significant groundwater recharge area. The 2003 hydrological report it indicated that this land could only be developed if this drumlin zone was not disturbed as the rest of the property is covered with clay and does not permit recharge. Uh, that is why the current zoning, quite correctly, does not allow construction on the middle part, but only on the east and west edges of the property. Uh, therefore, I recommend that you rec reject the current proposal. Uh, the removal of this recharge zone re risks increasing local spring flooding, which is already a problem, especially for those on the third line. Uh, the current zoning uh, aligns with the current on Ontario Ministry of Environment guidelines that state that rural development must not threaten the water quality or drainage of the region, especially when close to private wells or near a floodplain. Uh, this proposal does not meet the, that criteria. Uh, I have attached the 2017 technical rules under the Clean Water Act, which support that statement. Uh, the reports in the pro proposal do not uh, identify how much land is to be paved, but the removal of the drumlins, along with the high water requirements and the building's coverage means that groundwater will be adversely affected. In addition, North, ha North Gore has grown significantly since the 2003 report and also has currently 550 homes on the works. Groundwater needs for the development or future expansion in the village or for future communal wells should not be compromised by this kind of development. The current proposal uses outdated hydrological studies, which do not apply today because of the huge difference in the current plan versus 
what is currently being proposed. According to the Planning Act of the OPAs and ZBAs, the Broccolini was required to update the hydrological report to support the application before any significant zoning changes were approved, and that did not happen. Uh, additionally, under provincial regulatory and policy requirements, because this land was previously zoned ag prime agricultural, previous zoning, as is, and the current proposal must follow the provincial guidelines, which I have in my Appendix 5, which state that the land use is restricted as follows, and as, by the way, is currently the case, farm-related commercial and farm-related industrial, and it must be compatible with and not hinder agricultural operations. Additionally, those guidelines state that you should be appropriate to available service uh, available in the rural areas. That means road access, water, sewage, utilities, etc. And the, if it requires that, that, that sort of industry should be placed in an appropriate settlement area. The current zoning should still be subject to the same criteria as the past because this land is subject to these guidelines, which do not allow industrial activity, which is not farm related and does not re require these kinds of services. Uh, additionally, uh, it is both a logical, because of the lack of mapping and the concerns about overtaxing of the groundwater supplies, it is logical that the city had some understandable fears that groundwater extraction should be minimized. Uh, at least until there's a detailed map of the water table. Several post-Walkerton reports, which I have referred to, support that, which say the following. Non-agricultural activities, such as large water intakes, must also consider the context of local rural groundwater protection. The relevant procedures must be reviewed with respect to their impact on groundwater quality. Due to the fact that there are no specific client analysis or recognition of the impact no mitigations proposed, and the uncertainty I propose that this should not be approved. In summary, because the appropriate mandated and up-to-date water studies have not been carried out, because the recharge zone, which is currently excluded, is now to be built on, and because of this being prime agricultural land, this should not be approved. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, any question to the devil? Oh, Councilor Moffat, just... Uh, there's one question. Gord, did you say something about 550 homes are in the works for North Gore? Um, uh, there are, th there's land that is designated for that is what I've been told. That is, yeah, it, so are you taking that from the Rural Residential Land Survey to talk about the ability for people? Yes, okay. yes. It's not in the works. Though. No, no, it, it, it has the pos possibility of, okay. correct. Okay. Yeah. okay, thank you very much. Our next speaker is Sarah Richardson. Sarah, I think she's behind you. And after Sarah is Colleen Murphy. Go ahead, Matt. Thank you very much for providing this opportunity to comment at this forum. My presentation looks at Section 3 of the PPS that directs development away from natural hazards and human-made hazards when there is an unacceptable risk to public health and safety. We believed that it was important to prepare this presentation because the planning documentation is a little thin on this subject, and there are some key issues that are high in the public consciousness and very important for which there's little or no information provided. I'm going to focus on two of those issues, air pollution and climate change. Air pollution is a vital consideration associated with compatibility of land use given the residential and agricultural zoning surrounding this site plan. And if Ottawa's declaration of a climate emergency means anything, it means that careful planning is more important now than ever for not only our long-term survival, but also our, well, not only for our long-term prosperity, but also for our long-term survival. I have submitted a longer document to the chair with statistics and references to support this presentation. I'm going to start with air pollution. Air pollution kills thousands of Canadians every year and contributes to millions of symptom days for asthma sufferers and people with respiratory problems. It is a likely impact of the logistics activities associated with the proposed warehouse, a likely health impact. Research consistently links traffic emissions to negative impacts on human health, and diesel freight vehicles are the major source of near-road air pollution. This issue should be at the forefront of the proposal because of the proximity of the development to residential dwellings which are always considered sensitive uses. 
It seems as though the proposal presents a prima facie indication of a lack of compatibility in land use given the likelihood for negative impacts on adjacent residential uses. Section 1.2.6.1 of the PPS requires attention in planning to land use capacity, <coughs> compatibility of adjacent lands. This is supposed to prevent problems that could arise due to the encroachment of sensitive land uses and industrial land uses on one another. These problems <laughs> include the adverse effects of res to residents from contaminants, which under Ontario's guideline to help implement the PPS obligation includes air emissions through traffic and transportation associated with the facility. There is no information to suggest that this obligation was thoroughly assessed in the decision making around the warehouse proposal. One recent Canadian study found that a buffer of at least 500 meters is required to protect citizens from negative health impacts of large diesel trucks. This would require revisiting the buffer proposed in the staff report and the buffer, uh, the, additional, uh, the additional buffer proposed this morning between the facility and the residents of Third Line Road. Moreover, the adverse, where adverse effects are established for adjacent residential uses in a village such as North Gore, Section 3 of the uh, official plan requires that the city will not permit industrial uses on village land where there are likely to be negative impacts on adjacent residential uses. More information is needed to properly address this potential impact. The second issue that could be more present in the project proposal is climate change. There is a growing consensus that climate change is a public health emergency and the WHO has declared it the defining public health issue of the 21st century. Briefly, impacts include more incidences of extreme weather that is more dangerous and more deadly, increased exposure to disease, deteriorating air, food insecurity and increasing mental health problems. In April of this year, as we've heard, the City of Ottawa declared a climate emergency. If this is to mean anything, it should involve a review of policies and programs to bring them into line with the consensus science, such as that represented by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Just to be clear, the IPCC's forecasts for the climate and for the planet are dire. Just last year, it suggested that the negative impacts of 1.5 degrees Celsius of global warming will be far greater than expected and could be reached in as little as 11 years and almost certainly within 20 years at current levels of emissions. So our city's declaration that we are in a climate emergency must be given teeth and implementation should start now with the tools that are available. You to begin, the city could follow its own directions in the official plan to incorporate climate change into all levels of city decision making. This should be applied to help identify unacceptable levels of risk pursuant to section three of the PPS. There's no evidence that this was done in this proposal for any issue beyond flooding, which, which did not consider climate change and was based on out-of-date information and deferred until site plan approval. Ottawa has itself identified buildings and transportations as two major emitters of greenhouse gases. Yet there is no reference in the materials to assure that building design must promote energy efficiency and adopt forward-looking construction codes. Cars are the single largest emission, emitters of greenhouse gas emissions within the transportation sector in Ottawa and elsewhere, and in the context of this climate emergency, it makes no sense to build such okay. a large project on okay. attractive land with so many people driving to and from work, and I think we heard some great statistics about that a few I minutes ago. I, uh, I think that we need more information to properly address this thank potential you, impact as well. You know you're over your time, but I want to thank you for Sorry. giving me your submission earlier, and any submission we receive from uh, the resident, I send it to the clerk, and the clerk shared it with my colleagues, so they all have copy of you, because okay. if you have questions. Just to quick, when you were looking at this site from a climate change perspective, were you looking at this site as compared to how it sits today, or what's permitted to be built on it today? No, I was looking at it from the perspective of transportation and how many cars are going to be driving to and from the site at a time when the city is trying to propose zero emission public transportation, but there's right, no what, transportation what services. The impact exists today, right, on that site? in terms of what's permitted, in terms of printed uses, and what could be built today. Right, but not in the, in the concentration of employees that you have in your planning documents. You said 1,800 parking spots for 1,700 to 3,500 employees. That's the, those are the numbers I've seen. Right, but the site itself is, is zoned for a variety of uses that could easily accommodate that same number of transportation. Well, you'd have to bring us those numbers. I mean, we're not going to like... Okay. Okay, we're, we're not going to engage in that kind of hypothetical. No. You know, that's like trying to prove a negative. 
No, but Sarah, the question was from the councillor. You're looking at it from what is today. Like I, the, I'm looking at, yes, okay. sorry. Yes. I'm looking at okay. it from the proposal no, no, we had the, in front of us. That was the question. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very uh, much. Any other question? No. The next speaker is Colleen Murphy. All oh, right, here. And after Colleen is Steve. Uh, right on the desktop. There you go, right oh, there. Okay. Oops. I think I put Murray instead of Murphy. This sorry. Is Steve <laughs> is the woman. This uh, is Steve here. Steve. No, 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 no. Okay. <coughs> Okay, good, after good afternoon, members of the committee. My name is Colleen Murphy. I have been a resident of North Gore for over 20 years. I live on Third Line North with my family, my husband, and two children. My topic today is public engagement. In 2008, the community of North Gore and the City of Ottawa worked together to finalize the North Gore Secondary Plan. Residents involved in that process felt that the resulting plan reflected the rural character of their community. Oops, sorry, what's going on? The city, it seemed, listened and had a clear sense of what the village's priorities and their preferred path forward would be. Interestingly, as long-term resident Mr. Tupper has pointed out earlier today, there is a provision in the secondary plan for the height of church steeples. And I quote, a white church spire is the tallest structure in the village. Fast forward to 2019, and if the proposed mega warehouse becomes a reality, it will then become the tallest structure in our village. How's that for a statement of rural character and charm? <coughs> A change in zoning not only ignores the rural identity of the area, it ignores the many concerns outlined to you today by my fellow neighbours in North Gore and our surrounding communities. How is it that our voice has not been heard? Our voice has not been given the same weight as that accorded to others involved in this process, i.e. broccolini. If you look at the five pillars of public engagement, developed by the International Association of Public Participation and adapted by the City of Ottawa in their public engagement strategy, public engagement for the proposed zoning changes for this mega warehouse has been limited to date to the first two stages. The first stage, to inform, constitutes a low level of public engagement. On July 30th, the first trickle of information was received. As Debbie Bishop, my neighbor, indicated, there was a letter sent to residents bordering the, this site, but no one else, not even <coughs> those across the street. It seems the rules the city has in place to inform affected residents are very urban-centric. A notice to property owners within 120 meters of the proposed site does not translate to sufficient notice in a rural community. It's not surprising then that at a standing room only public meeting on October 17th, which had been delayed for over a month to allow the developer more time to prepare, was strife with negative comments. The second stage of public engagement, consult, was limited again to a select number of residents with minimal feedback from the city as a result of those consultations. So if you look at the five pillars of public engagement, the last three, involve, collaborate, and empower, have really been restricted to those to the city and the developer Broccolini. The scope of, sorry, best practices of public engagement indicate that the scope of engagement, pro, the scope of the engagement process should align with the magnitude and complexity of the decision being made. In other words, if this zoning change only affected a few residents, then the public engagement we have had to date might have been adequate. However, as you have heard from many of my neighbours, there are far-reaching effects of this the zoning change, and most of us were only provided details at the meeting on October 17th. In the few short weeks that we've had since that public meeting, we collected over 3,000 signatures on a petition that clearly states that we, the residents of North Gore and the surrounding communities, want due process. 3,000 signatures, pretty impressive for a community of 2,000 people. 
We went door to door in the cold and explained to our neighbors that by signing the petition, they would be standing beside us saying we want due process before this is a done deal. And they signed. On average, 85 to 90 percent of the people asked agreed that the city is pushing this warehouse through without doing its due diligence. I asked the committee today to listen to the voices you have heard in front of you and reject this proposal. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Connie. Uh, sir, you have a question? Just a quick comment uh, yeah. just to your, oh, on your, about the engagement and the collaboration aspect. A lot of the, the changes that I've tried to propose to this site to try to address concerns came directly from residents. Mm -hmm. Like when I met with Carlos Adamson not too long ago and showed him the, the motion we had, or that the report had 40 meters, Carlos said it would be a lot better if that was 100 meters. That's in the motion today. When I met with James Graham, he talked about there was a lot of concern about losing the recreational aspect, losing that future ability um, to have recreational uses in the community that was designed for this site. So we included that in, I made sure Brooklyn included as a permitted use on the entire site. Uh, there was, there's been more to that. The, the, um, the volumetric zoning came up from one of, those, one of those meetings. The volumetric zoning came up from one of those public meetings that we had, uh, one of the meetings I had with residents. It was a third line road resident that suggested that volumetric zoning model that isn't, we don't use that anywhere else in the city, but we developed it for this site just based on that feedback from residents at a, at a meeting. So those things don't exist without that consultation that I had with residents and Broccoli and Evolve. Well, that's great, but I think you can well, tell. Just, you're saying it, it, it's, you said that we didn't. No, I didn't say that. I just said it's been limited to a, to a certain number of residents. There's 2,000 of us in North Gore, yeah, plus cars. the most cars. impacted residents are second line road and third line road residents. <laughs> Have you not been listening? <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, folks, that's okay. Let's stay on focus on the item. So, so we have the next speaker. Is it Steve Norton? Steve, are you here? That takes fifteen percent of the Scott. 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 Fifteen percent. Do the math. Scott. <coughs> Scott. We don't want to engage that. Okay, uh, folks. Let's. You've been doing great all morning. We've been listening. You've been very prepared, very articulated. Let's keep it that way, please. So the next speaker is uh, Steve uh, Norton. Is Steve here? No. Randy Lavia, is Steve here? Steve's okay, well. Steve's coming. Steve's okay. here. <coughs> Next to Steve is Randy. Lavia. Good afternoon, Steve. Good afternoon, Chair, Councillors. Thank you for uh, hearing me today. I have a number of matters that uh, I'd like to speak about. <coughs> I apologize for my uh, rough voice. You've heard from uh, many people today about uh, sort of the incongruence of this uh, proposal, the zoning and official plan amendment with the provincial policy statement. I won't get into the details and give you the subsection numbers as to how it doesn't mesh up with the provincial policy statement and cascadingly down with the City of Ottawa's official plan and the village secondary plan. I'd like to speak to you a bit about uh, sort of the macro level. You've had introductions about that already today, the effects of climate change. There are, uh, you know, numerous studies that have spoken about the negative effects of climate change. What I haven't heard today and what you haven't heard today, I'm sorry, is <clears throat> how that translates into cost to both government and to private citizens insofar as insurance risk. There are um, a number of studies that have been done. I've researched extensively a uh, 2018 <coughs> Parliament of uh, Australia report that um, speaks to <coughs> just that. And uh, I've had the good pleasure of being in Australia a number of times over the past year. Um, they are like us, heavily um, reliant upon extractable resources and um, they are facing uh, intense weather events that have led to uh, the loss of life and uh, thousands or millions of dollars of damage. The, um, 
one of the things in that report is that uh, climate change projections are, are conservative. And you've heard already the um, plus 20% for the one in 100 year worst planning, planning, worst case planning benchmark is no longer applicable. Um, then you get into the heart of the matter on insurance. The uh, insurance um, company, IA Financial Group, which has um, worldwide reach, has stated that um, current planning and zoning requirements do not reflect the level of risk communities will face in the future. The IAG argued that a thorough review is needed of planning and zoning requirements to ensure that they are changed to reflect the range of scenarios and forecasts in risk exposure that will occur with climate change. IAG argued that current land planning and zoning requirements are misaligned with insurance risk and that this places pressure on the affordability of insurance. What it also speaks to is the fact that insurance cost projections are done over a 12-month basis, whereas mortgages are done over a longer-term period of time. And the higher the costs of insurance goes up, the lower the property values become. You are talking about, and you've heard many proposals and seen photos of the downstream effects of the flooding, which would be exacerbated by the runoff from uh, creating this project. We respectfully request, as others have said, that you reject this proposal based on the fact that there is insufficient study done on a number of environmental aspects in addition to what I've just raised here with respect to insurance. I'd also like to um, state a bit about the fact that e-commerce, nobody's done a, um, well, uh, my colleague Ziggy did a, a bit of a, a discussion on that, but insofar as social cohesion and the public pol or the provincial policy statement and the Ottawa official plan, the um, sort of multinational large businesses that would come in, give low skill, low paying jobs, such as the ones that would be at this warehouse, are sounding a death knell for local, small and medium sized businesses. You've heard talk speakers today talk about that fact, the competition that will drive people away. The city of Ottawa, in its planning and forecasting, is looking to the youth to become better educated and to go and work in high-tech, high-skilled jobs. And I'm not even going to get into the fact that we need tradespeople. We need sufficient tradespeople to be able to keep you all You have to left. Thank you. I'd just like to wrap up with a little bit about the need for social cohesion writ large in the face of what will be a very dire climate change consequences, including mass migration to Canada. And we will have to absorb larger populations from areas that are no longer habitable. And for that, we all need to pull together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Any uh, question for the delegate? See none. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next is Randy. Mr. Chairman, committee members, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Randy Levere. I own the property directly east of the proposed uh, changing property. I'm speaking here primarily on uh, issues that I am opposed to, as well as a number of the other residents in the area. And I'm quite certain everybody's aware that there's a lot of people upset over the thing. I don't, I'm not going to dwell on a lot of the things that have already been said. I had prepared that, but I'm going to move on to what, what the crux of my argument is. Um, I was very involved with this property right from 19,901, when the first subdivisions were offered on that property, back when Bill Scouton was still a, a, a council member. Moving ahead to 1998, the uh, Township of Rideau at that time proposed this commercial and in, uh, industrial park. And at that time, they didn't give us quite enough information before, before it went to committee to be approved. It was approved. I was the one that opposed it at OMB. And I took it to OMB at that time. And OMB got in touch with me and said, uh, 
could we send a mediator and maybe work with some of these issues? I said, sure, a mediator would be much better than causing the cost of an OMB hearing and everything else. But I had issued an OMB, I had filed for OMB. Um, at the time, I was told that uh, Rideau Township, in order to be a good uh, corporate citizen or a township citizen in regional Carlton, Carlton uh, County, uh, they didn't have a, a park at that time that would generate commercial taxation to add to the pool. Uh, I was, uh, <clears throat> we had a number of concerns and the number of our concerns at the time were very similar to the concerns that everybody has stated here today. One of the concerns was we wanted to have a listing of the type of, 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 of properties or commercial industries that went in. As a result, uh, they, the township, uh, Rideau Township made a list <coughs> outlining what each of those individual areas would be. And uh, as a result of that, they told us and at, at the meeting, they told the, our OMB or our uh, mediation meeting, which was accepted, that uh, they assured us at that time that it would be services for the community. And that's why there was a number of those issues like garages, feed stores, mechanical, uh, all of the allocated uses. Um, they also told us that this park was being designed very closely to the parks in Osgood, uh, being Greeley Park, and in the township of South Gore, which is now uh, the municipality of uh, North Grenville, uh, South Gore Business Park, they wanted a park like that. I couldn't argue with it. I'm a major landowner in that park and my businesses have been working there for 35 years. I still have it. Um, they uh, told us that we would be getting services like electrical, plumbing, etc. Uh, one of the things that we did go out after was the fact that there could be an amendment in the bylaw down the road and the next thing you know we're going to have a Coca-Cola plant in our backyard. And they assured us that this wasn't the, 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 the uh, intent, the insurance insured us at that time that the intent was to put in community type businesses, small manufacturers, cabinet makers, uh, uh, furniture makers, uh, feed stores, uh, anything that would enhance the, the, the property. At that time, uh, they went ahead and I was given uh, an assurance that uh, this would... Uh, uh, what it, what the, it came in the assurance was this agreement is prepared in accordance with the laws of the province of Ontario. This agreement shall ensure the benefit and be binding upon the executors, administrators, successors, and assigners to the successful of this property title. You have 30 uh, seconds left. To go, to go to a, a, an issue like that, and then have to re-submit uh, this again uh, when we've been assured by the Ontario Municipal Board that this is, it has been accepted, uh, I, can, I think uh, it, it's not right. In submission, in, in uh, conclusion, in conclusion I uh, I, thank you very much. Uh, I, I think that, that, the, that the committee has to look at the fact that this is one of the only pieces of property in the area to, to, to support the area. As the area has grown in 20 years, I think that if you shut this down or, 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 turn, or accept Broccolini's proposal, you're going to uh, deprive the community of the services that could be in this, on this type of property. There's no other property set aside for it. I thank you very much, gentlemen. And, thank, and thank you, thank you for uh, for your any question. A question from Councillor Darus. Yes. Th thank you, thank you, Randy, for the uh, clarification. Just quick question. So you are opposed for the uh, proposal in front of us, but you're not opposed of having uh, other the industrial park or some other business. Oh, there. not at all. Yes. Just so I am, so oh. just to so clarify that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, and the uh, next speaker is Joe Sullivan. And after Joe is Cindy Armstrong. Okay. 
Thank you. Good afternoon. I am Jo Sullivan, and I live on Roger Stevens Drive within walking distance of the proposed warehouse. Thank you for allowing us to speak to you regarding the proposed zoning change to incorporate a seven-story warehouse into the village of North Gore. The City of Ottawa has declared a climate emergency, yet our Councillor Scott Moffat, Chairman of the Environmental Committee, is in favour of the change in zoning. This warehouse will create air pollution from traffic, noise pollution 24-7, light pollution and water pollution. Already two endangered species have been affected, butternut trees have been cut down and the barn is gone where the barn swallows used to nest. We hope the remaining members of the committee are more open-minded. I am new to the village of North Gore. I have only lived there 45 years. It is a very old village. There are families that have been there five or six generations. There has been a lot of change in 45 years. I had no neighbours when I first arrived. The first neighbours were the township office and garage, now known as the city service centre and transportation garage. We have a large subdivision of expensive homes across from us and the third line homes subdivided of, uh, off the pro <coughs> subject property are equally beautiful. The Holy Pilgrim Church has changed to become a Tamil temple. In 2001, we became part of the amalgamated city of Ottawa. At that time, a city planner came out to North Gore and met with the village residents. They worked not hours, but years to come up with the 2008 approved plan for the village of North Gore that was acceptable to both the village and the city of Ottawa. That was just over 10 years ago. The property we are discussing is within the village boundaries of North Gore. It is now zoned commercial industrial. The commercial is on the east side of the property where highway, beside for, Highway 416. And the plan was for a service centre, restaurants, perhaps a small hotel for the travelling public. There could also be um, craft shops, uh, antique shops, farmer's market, a farm equipment or snowmobile dealership, a recreation area or dome could be in the center. The industrial is on the west side of the property and would be similar to Colonnade Road, a welding shop, car body shop, landscaping company, electrical plumbing or furniture repair business. All of it would be on individual wells and septic systems and no higher than three stories. It was all to be to the benefit of the rural agricultural farming community. That zoning is still in place. The warehouse is to be seven stories high. 1,500 employees driving their own cars. We do not have bus service. 240 18-wheelers trucks a day, 24-7. It will have wells that, what will happen to our water table? It will have runoff ponds, and its own sewage plant. The effluence, or sewage, from the plant will run into the Johnson drainage ditch, which is presently used for flood water. The sewage will then draw, drain into Stevens Creek, past cars into the Rideau River, that is part of the World Heritage Canal, and past Mooney's Bay Beach. We do not want a warehouse with the within the village boundaries of North Gore. I have a question, Mr. DeRuz. How would your village of Osgood like a seven-story warehouse beside their fire station? Or in Metcalf, on the fairgrounds? Or in Greeley? Mm -hmm. Highway 31 runs north to south for easy access to the 401. All it takes is a zoning change. Ms. Meehan, Ottawa South is a beautiful new suburb and you have a large park on a river, um, on the river uh, beside the Riverside Road. Um, how would your constituents feel about a seven-story warehouse in the park? All it takes is a zoning change. Ms. Sullivan, you have 30 seconds left. I hope you're going to mention CARP. I, <laughs> Mr. Al Shantari, you are the chair of the committee. Your village of Dunrobin had a tornado and Constance Bay had a flooding. A rough couple of years, but they are rebuilding. How would they like a warehouse? You, too, 
you do have warehouses on the carp road, but not in a village. How would the villagers feel about a warehouse on the south entrance of carp or looming over the escarpment? I would like to read a quotation. Deep within its conscience, man discovers a law which he has not laid upon himself, but which he must obey. Its voice ever calling him to love and to do what is good and to avoid evil sounds in his heart in the right moment. Tomorrow morning, when you look in the mirror, be proud of the image you see. You heeded the call to do good and avoid evil. You stood up for the villagers and the little guy. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Ms. Armstrong. Uh, any question from my colleague? No question. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker is uh, Leah Andrea Watson, Burnett. Brunette, sorry. What's the last name? Duffet. Duffet. <coughs> might have been lost. Ah. So good afternoon. Thank you for your patience this afternoon in, in listening to us all speak. Uh, my name is Leandria Brunet. I live at 2111 Stratton Drive in North Gore, and I am opposed to the proposed zoning and official plan amendments. At just over eight months pregnant, I am operating on limited lung capacity right now, so I do ask that you bear with me. Um, my husband and I both grew up in small agricultural towns. We wanted that same experience for our children, so we chose to move from the city to North Gore. We made the decision to pay higher taxes for less services because it meant we had a beautiful little piece of property in a beautiful growing community, um, and it took us away from the traffic and the congestion. So it's the flaws and the lack of proper study included in the transportation impact study presented by Novatech that is what originally brought me to oppose the proposed zoning and official plan amendments. In the report, section 4.1.1 roadways mentions third line as a two lane undivided collector high, uh, sorry, roadway with a rural cross section. It admits the fact that this road bottlenecks down to one lane over a small bridge and it does not mention the lack of shoulder or sidewalks. Under forecasting trip distribution and assignment, section 5.1.2 employees, the trip distribution for employees is expected to be 78% to and from the north, Kanata, Nepi, and Barhaven, Manatic. The report says that a warehouse or a facility of this typical size could have up to 1,100 employees per shift, non-peak season. So if we divide that 78% evenly, it means that we're looking about 39% would be traveling from Barhaven and Manatic. These employees will not be using the 416 as it's suggested. To make the best possible time during their commute, they will head down Prince of Wales via third line where it bottlenecks to meet at Rogers Stevens. And that percentage works out to approximately 429 vehicles per shift. The figure, uh, I'm sorry, figure three in site generated traffic volumes projects 24. So allow me to reiterate that. 429 potential vehicles versus 25 per shift. Figure three also shows that this intersection at Third Line and Roger Stevens Drive remains unsignalized. So the study focuses only on intersections in front of the proposed uh, property and does not at all address impacts or proposed controls at the top of Third Line where it meets Prince of Wales. And I say top because it is very much found at the top of a hill. And this hill creates a blind for three driveways and all of those turning onto and off of Stratton Drive at Third Line. Commuters will quickly discover that turning back onto Prince of Wales can prove difficult with site restrictions and the lineup of possibly 429 vehicles per shift will cause a backup and congestion along the third line road and therefore will, they will undoubtedly cut across Stratton Drive. Stratton Drive does not have sidewalks. There are children who play on the street, walkers, runners and dogs and the speed in which the commuters will travel the shortcut is a safety issue for the residents. And although one could take from my statements what they will and turn my argument into a not in my backyard reaction, it is a legitimate concern that the infrastructure is not in place Studies are incomplete, and this is a matter of the wrong vision and the use of this land with a growing list of negative impacts to its surrounding community. During this process, I actually started to see the similarities between what I do for a living and what's happening here. And every day in my line of work, there are new products, new equipment, new discoveries coming out onto the market, and the salespeople start, start calling, they start knocking. And they bring their brochures, and it's chock full of promises and clinical studies that back up their claims, and in this case, Broccolini's come calling. My job as a trusted advisor for my clients is to break down information into simple, understandable terms, research the validity of the product claims, investigate possible negative impacts, side effects, 
all possible contraindications, and ultimately ensure that what I recommend to my clients aligns with their best interests. What we have here essentially is an emperor's new clothes situation where we're being marketed a package with invisible contents. In this case, Broccolini sales reps are trying to sell us on packaging that will hopefully contain something of worth or value. We've all read the brochure. Some of us at some point might have even bought into the claims. But my neighbors, the community, we've poked so many holes in that brochure. We have brought to light additional information, flaws, omissions, and oversights, and we've brought the undeniable research to you. So I've come to see the proposal for the fancy marketing package that it is, and I hope that you recognize that as well, and that you also don't buy into it. It's my hope that you will agree with the best uses for 1966 Roger Stevens Drive is by doing what the current you zoning allows to do. You've got 30 seconds to left. Provide multiple uses and opportunities for diverse growth that are beneficial to their surrounding community. That is what aligns with your clients, aka North Gore's best interests, that is not only what aligns with our current goal and future goals, but they align with those of ARAC itself. This is not the right fit. This is not the appropriate location. Please vote no to these proposed zoning and official plan amendments. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. Thank you very much. Question? Any question for Leah? Let's see now. Sorry. Okay, Councillor Derouz. Thank you. So your, your, uh, f from my understanding, your concern is the traffic a component of it or the whole thing? No, it, that's what just, originally drew me to, I just to make the sure table. Yes. Because you were just you were talking and proposed of everything, but you said that your traffic is your biggest piece. So, but you're opposed to no. whole. That my traffic is what would brought me to the table. But it is it is the current amendments to the zoning that that I stand Perfect. against. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leah. Uh, next speaker, uh, I'm not sure. Is W Duffet? W Okay, yeah. William. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and the council members. Uh, I am William Duffett, and I am a Curzon resident in North Gore on uh, Maple Forest Drive. I am opposed to these uh, developments. I'm here today to speak to the community regarding the large warehouse development on Roger Stevens Drive. On the 16th of April, 2019, the City of Ottawa declared a climate emergency regarding the validity of the city's motions. Mr. Moffat, you were quoted in a CBC article as saying, if it was symbolic, I would not be here, and I wouldn't let it get to this point. And now it's time to actually stand behind what you and the city said. Roger Stevens' proposal, as it stands now, seems to totally contravene what the city and you, Mr. Moffat, said that you stand for in respect to the environment. Environment Canada states on their website that in 2017, the transportation sector was the second largest source of greenhouse gas emissions, accounting for 24% of all emissions in Canada. 59.9 megatons of CO2 per year are produced from freight trucks. Passenger vehicles account for 34.6 megatons, and light trucks account for 50%. Given these statements, how is this even that a development like this gets this far? If you're talking about 1,700 people working at the site, how are they going to get there? There's only one way to get into North Gore, and it, as there is no public transportation. That means an increase of 1,700 cars on the road each day. The City of Ottawa Environment Committee will be releasing a report on the 17th of November regarding the upcoming report. Mr. Moffat, you were quoted in the citizen... Uh, William, can you, William, yep. when you address, address the chair of the committee. You don't have okay. to name other council, please. Quoted in the citizen of the 19th, uh, 19th of November saying, big emission reduction gains depends on the massive shift in the transportation sector, especially the automotive sector. How is this supposed to propose proposal on the Roger Stevens conducive of this statement? How can you stand behind a climate emergency declaration when you, on the other hand, supported development on this type where there is no infrastructure in place to lessen the environmental impact of the development? Decisions that are made today will impact the community for years to come. It's my generation and the generations after me that will have to deal with the fallout from these decisions. Again, I'm quoting the interview that you gave the citizen. It states that you believe that what's good for the economy and what's good for the environment aren't mutually exclusive. Well, in this case, they are. Economics seems to be the driving force to push this development through without any consideration of the environmental or the spirit of the climate emergency declaration that you championed. In conclusion, you need to explain to the youth of the city, as well as everyone here, that you're ignoring your own climate, climate emergency declaration when it comes to North Gore. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, William. Any question for the applicant? Thank you, thank you very much, sir. Uh, next speaker is Janine uh, Con. Con oh, oh, Jennifer, sorry, Jennifer, not Janine. Great, thanks very much. Um, before I get started today, I'd like to acknowledge that the land we're meeting on uh, is the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe peoples. Uh, so my name is Jennifer Conlon. I am uh, probably a third or fourth uh, generation resident of the North Core area. Um, for all of the reasons stated earlier today with respect to uh, objection on the proposal, uh, I too uh, strongly urge the committee to uh, reject the proposal in front. Um, the proposal in sight I wanted to talk about uh, perhaps some different factors today, and that is the archeological and cultural significance. Um, to go back in time, I guess 10,000 years in sort of four minutes or less um, will be a pretty quick trip, but I'll try to hit a, a couple of the salient points. Um, so this area in question is sort of marked by the, the two arrows at the bottom that note uh, the Wellington Ridge. Cars on the right uh, and North Gore on the left. Um, this area historically um, has been just a rich and diverse uh, ecological, um, architectural, uh, archaeological, and cultural uh, mix um, because of the water, because of the proximity to uh, eskers, um, drumlins that have been already mentioned, the glacial fluval deposits. Um, there is historical evidence of a number of uh, family groupings and settlements around today, what is known as the village of North Gore, um, including the Riverwood uh, drumlin. Um, there's linkages directly to the ancestral Rita River, uh, a key migratory and transportation uh, route itself. And as many of you are aware, the Rideau River UNESCO and Canadian Natural Heritage designations do apply to the lower Rideau subwatershed, of which Stevens Creek plays such an integral role. Um, so it receives runoff from and is adjacent to the property in question, and of course is integrated with elements of uh, the floodplain itself. So it requires our protection. In addition, this area has a significant uh, cultural aspect related to Indigenous peoples. Uh, so both oral and written history notes that Indigenous people in the North Gore and surrounding area developed a trail along the height of the land through the forest. And the topography of North Gore demonstrates that this portion of 1966 Rogers Stevens Drive is in fact the highest elevation in the area. Uh, there's also stories of <coughs> old growth forest and trails. In 2008, we had an excavation uh, around the Cars uh, Drumlin where 210 artifacts, over 210 artifacts representing indigenous peoples uh, were discovered uh, and it's pictured, uh, pictured here. There are many other historical references that cite trading between settlements in proximity to the Rideau River uh, from the St. Lawrence heading north through Burroughs Rapids up through North Gore into the mouth of the Ottawa River. And we also have many historical references to the Algonquins residing in the Rideau Valley. And I also just wanted to point out that oral history and recollection uh, are recognized and established as valid in Canadian jurisprudence by the 1997 Delgamoc decision. In conclusion, I just wanted to point out Section 2.1 Natural Heritage of the Policy states that, of course, development and site alteration shall not be permitted on adjacent lands unless the ecological function of the adjacent lands has been evaluated and it has been demonstrated that there will be no negative impacts on the natural features or on their ecological functions. In addition, based on section 2.6, cultural heritage and archeology, span including those guidelines for consultant archeologists, this proves that the location of 1966 Roger Stevens Drive is adjacent to and incorporates indicators of both pre-contact Aboriginal as well as historic Euro-Canadian archeological potential. This includes the proximity to historical transportation routes, water, elevation, and or oral history recollections from Indigenous peoples. In conclusion, there is insufficient information within the city or proponents' documentation to really demonstrate that any of the above mentioned portions of the PPS have been considered, particularly consultation with Indigenous community representatives is required. And due to the archaeological and cultural significance of this property, including adjacent lands and waterways, Further assessment of the property at 1966 Roger Stevens Drive is recommended. I strongly urge the committee to do just that. And in conclusion, I'd like to suggest rejection of this application as proposed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Any question for Jennifer? No, okay. 
We're done with this. Our next speaker is uh, Diana Drew. Drew. So Diana, 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 Diana Drew. Drew. And after Diana, we have Connie, Connie Hart. My name is Diane Drew. I am a resident of North Gore, Ontario. Um, and I would just like to say that I oppose the rezoning and official plan amendment. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, your comment noted. Thank you. Uh, next is Connie Hart. Thank you. Um, I'm Connie Hart. I, I'm a resident of North Gore as well. I live on Maple Forest Drive, um, and I'm a, I'm a scientist. I work for the federal government in Canada. And I, I'll keep my comments very brief, as uh, my fellow community members have already detailed a lot of issues. And I just wanted to reiterate my concern um, that this proposal is not in line with the, the ARAC mandate. Uh, just mentioning again some of the, ish, the ARAC mandate um, to support and encourage the appropriate and sustainable use of land for agriculture, forestry, and recreation, and actively encourage the establishment and prosperity of farms and related businesses, and also to encourage the orderly development and management of growth that maintains and strengthens the character of the city's rural areas, including its hamlets and villages, and promotes the concentration of growth within the established and planned settlements. And I just want to mention to say that I think that this proposal will not strengthen the character of the rural uh, and agricultural areas of North Gore or encourage the prosperity of farms and agricultural businesses in North Gore. Um, and it, it, in fact, has the potential to destroy the, the agriculture and rural nature of this community. I just also would like to just mention that my residential area in North Gore is expanding with new houses being built towards North Gore. Uh, and those new residences are being marketed as country living. And to me, this seems completely contradictory and somewhat disingenuous to have area planners supporting the building of residences uh, with country living and at the same time supporting a mega warehouse development that will literally be within walking distance of these residences. So it just in this era of climate change concerns and environmental concerns and the need to maintain rural and agricultural areas, I would just request that the city planners and the ARAC community members support our agricultural and rural areas as the ARAC mandate requires and uh, reject the proposal as as proposed. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Any questions? For no. Thank you. Our uh, next speaker is Anna Riley. <coughs> Good afternoon, committee members. Um, my name's Anna Riley. I live at 6441 Fourth Line Road um, in North Gore. Uh, I'm a very new resident. I've only lived there since August, but I got involved with this because um, I heard about it, I was on the fence about it, I looked more into it, and I came to the conclusion that I'm in opposition to it. Um, so I'd like to thank you for hearing our concerns with respect to the proposed official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment for 1966 Roger Stevens Drive. Um, I'm concerned that the proposal will ne negatively impact the rural character of the community, <coughs> the economic development and employment opportunities to support the rural and agricultural community now and in the future. Traffic causing delays and safety issues for farm vehicles and cyclists, not just on Roger Stevens Drive, but throughout the village at Fourth Line Road and Third Line Road as traffic gets redirected. Um, groundwater levels and well water, stormwater management exacerbating flooding, property damage, and risks to public safety. Um, I also wonder what the future vision of the city is for our rural areas. Um, I spoke to people in other areas with warehouses, uh, like economic development and planning people, um, and everyone I spoke to had long-term plans for their industrial areas and the role that their distribution centers would play in their community. 
Um, they were on industrial parks. They had a long-term plan. It was very well thought out. It wasn't a cornfield. Um, I'm also concerned about the quality and comprehensiveness of several of the supporting studies submitted by the project proponent as part of the OPA and the ZBLA applications. Um, and I'm concerned about the misrepresentation or cherry picking of PPP, PPS policies, sorry, provincial policy statement policies to support the proposed official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment. So the Planning, Infrastructure and Economic Development Department of the City of Ottawa concluded in its November 25th recommendation to ARAC that the proposed amendment to the North Gore Secondary Plan is in conformity with the City of Ottawa's official plan and that the OPA and ZBLA are consistent with the PPS 2014 Part 5 policies. Um, I respectfully disagree. Further, and further argue that the proposal is not consistent with the PPS read as a whole. Um, I would like to take, I, I would like to highlight a few points. The Planning, Infrastructure and Economic Development Department's conclusion that the OPA and ZBLA are consistent with the PPS policies. Focus, one, focuses heavily on the proposal's impact on employment and economic development to the exclusion of other relevant PPS policies and two, relies on a mischaracterization of the development as building on the existing designations, zoning, and permitted uses for the site. Um, as you know, municipal decisions must be consistent with the provincial policy statement, and the term shall be consistent with provides very little, if any, discretion in implying Part 5 PPS policies. Municipal decisions that affect a planning matter cannot be in conflict with the policy objectives in whole or in part. The PPS 2014 does not promote employment opportunities and economic development and competitiveness in all instances and all forms, or to the exclusion of the other policies. Within both the city's official plan and the PPS, the objective of economic development in rural areas is always tied to the objective of supporting farming agribusiness and the rural economy. Part three of the PPS 2014 provides direction on the application of the PPS and its policies and specifically provides that the PPS is more than a set of individual policies. The PPS is to be read in its entirety and relevant policies are to be applied to each situation. When more than one policy is relevant, a decision maker should consider all the relevant policies to understand how they work together. Secondly, and now you have 30 seconds left. Um, I'll just summarize then. The, um, while warehouse is a permitted use, the proposal for this giant warehouse is so markedly different um, in scale and nature from what was originally contemplated that um, it should be considered in a totally different way. It doesn't leverage rural assets, amenities, does not support the vitality and economic health of the community. Um, now or in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. Any question for the delegate? No. Thank you very much, Anna. Thank you. <laughs> Our uh, next speaker is uh, James Beach and uh, Steve, uh, Steve uh, Sent. On. Oh, that's different. Yeah, different. That's different. Uh, no, we're done. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Each one will have a five minute to address the committee. Who's going to go first? I can go first, Chair. Thank you. If you can press your button, please. Uh, Is it? Uh, yes, there we go. Okay. Good afternoon, Chair, Co-Chair, and Committee members. My name is James Beach. I'm the Director of Real Estate and Development for Broccolini, the applicant for the 1966 Roger Stevens OPA and ZBLA applications being presented here today. Thank you for considering our applications. As City Council staff uh, noted at the commencement of this meeting today, you are here today to consider amendments to the official plan and zoning bylaws currently governing the 1966 Roger Stevens industrial and highway commercial property. 
To be clear, Broccolini has not submitted an application or a proposal for a 700,000 square foot mega warehouse. At this time, Broccolini has only submitted applications to permit warehouse use of up to a maximum of, of 22 meters in height and to have the ability to position a future building on the site with greater flexibility. More specifically, to place a future building in the center of these lands further away from the adjacent properties than what would be currently permitted today. If our applications are approved, Broccolini would look to come forward with a project-specific site plan, application, and corresponding building design, where at that time we would be required to address a number of the concerns the speakers have previously addressed. We would like to thank, sincerely thank the residents for their comments to date, some of which have altered the language in our application to ultimately promote better, less impactful development, and we hope to continue the dialogue in a productive manner should our applications be approved by the committee. Uh, we remain available to answer any questions uh, that may have arisen during this session. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Beast. Do you wish to speak? Uh, with, uh... Um, thank you. My name is Steve Pence. I'm the planning consultant with Novatec. We work with Broccolini in preparing the applications, and in particular, we prepared the planning rationale to support these amendments. I'm not here today to, to um, spend a lot of time talking about the um, interpretation of PPS policies and official plan policies as our interpretation and those positions with respect to good planning are represented in our planning rationale. And um, we've heard a lot of comments today about, about the um, inadequacy of some of the reports that were prepared in support of the applications. Um, it's not uncommon when official plan and zoning bylaw amendments are prepared that um, the, the reports that accompany those applications um, are there to support the development in principle. We often in the development community recognize that the details for development come at the site plan stage, provided we can provide enough um, information at the, at the principle of development stage, i.e. the official plan amendment and the zoning bylaw amendment, um, that is enough to go to the site plan approval stage. So those details will come at a future date. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about the merits of the application. I think you'll hear a lot of people booing and um, sort of rejecting the comments that I would make. But I would say there's a lot of good reasons why this application should be approved. Um, you've heard things about the principle of development on these lands already being established. They're industrial. They are commercial in nature. And the applications are essentially a refinement of those designations to accommodate a changing market and to take advantage of the location and lot area. What's important about that is the lot area provides a considerable opportunity to develop the site in a manner that would respect the nearest residential uses. So I just want to touch on that and just kind of leave you with those thoughts as these lands are, are, are quite suitable and almost ideally located for this type of use, despite what you're hearing from the public. And um, again, I would, um, I would say that um, I'm available for questions as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you both, Mr. Beach and uh, Mr. Pence. We have a question we start with Councillor Meehan. Councillor Meehan. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for, for coming out today. I know that uh, it was probably a bit challenging to, to think about coming up with uh, everybody opposed to it. Um, is it Mr. Beach? Mr. Beach, can you say that you are not proposing uh, the, the type of facility that everyone expects that you are proposing? What, what exact, can you spell out what you are proposing? Currently, we've submitted a zoning bylaw application and an official plan amendment to change the existing zoning and use of the site to permit warehouse use across the entire site up to a maximum of 22 meters in height. We have not come forward with a specific application for a specific use at this time. Can, and can you say, though, what you are going to be using it for? Uh, currently today, without zoning in place to support a use that we are currently looking at, uh, I can't say that. So are you looking at a facility that is 700,000 square feet that's going to employ upwards of 1,500 people? We have looked at opportunities that have metrics that, uh, that absolutely reflect uh, what you've just described. Okay. 
Uh, how, how would you address the issue of uh, traffic impact? Because there is no public transit out to that location. Uh, and you've heard today concerns that this is going to back up traffic um, in, in the community onto Highway 416. Can you address that? Councillor, uh, okay. before the, because this is part of the uh, site plan uh, approval. I don't think it will be part of the zoning application. Am I correct? Uh, well, I think. Legal. I just want to make sure we don't. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, traffic impact analysis is typically done at the site plan control process. Uh, I, I understand what you're saying, Chair, but the fact of the matter is there's a lot of people from the community here today and they've raised that. I think, can it not, we not legitimately get the, um, the proponent to, to talk about that? Because we, we have to deal with what's on the front of us today, and on the front of us is official plan amendment and zoning. And I, I do believe strongly the community wants to engage in the site plan approval, but I think we'll hear from Councillor Moffitt how he will engage the community. And we had asked earlier to put a holding provision so there will be no permit, nothing happened before the site plan approval deal with traffic, uh, water, groundwater, uh, flooding, uh, all those uh, they will and be dealt with on, on that level. So. And when will, when will that be? I'm not quite yeah, sure. They haven't applied for the site plan yet. Okay. So I just, I wanted to understand then, uh, we are looking at a significant warehouse. Would that be correct? We are, haven't submitted an application yet for a specific building. So I, could you rephrase the question, please? Um, you haven't got a specific size, but you, it is 22 meters. Would that be, is that accurate? If you're looking at, at uh, We are looking at having the, flexibility to have a building that is 22 meters in height, correct? Okay. And the, our understanding of a of 700,000 square foot facility is not quite accurate? Is that we're jumping the, the gun on that? The applications in front of us today, that metric was a metric that we were requested by city staff to present a concept, and that concept happened to be a 700,000 square foot building. Our applications here today are not to request approval for a 700,000 square foot warehouse. Why this site? Why, the, why are you choosing this site in, the, in a village? From a planning perspective, from a planning perspective um, this site presents a lot of good opportunity for development of this sort of use. Um, when you look at what the provincial policy statement talks about in terms of um, making sure that, um, that sites are, are zoned and, and ready for, for this kind of development. They are to be located near major transit corridors. They are, they are, they are there to make sure that access can be, can be quick. And, and another important aspect of this site is that it's a large site that already has fundamentally the, the principal development already established. So it, it, it has a warehouse use listed already as a permitted use. The amendments here are just really to refine that to enlarge, to allow for a taller building to accommodate a bigger, say, shall we say, building envelope. And the official plan amendment is, is there just to recognize that it's not only for um, catering to the rural community. Um, these sites should cater to the greater need for economic development and warehouse uses. So it's, it's about refining uh, uh, the economic reality of today, and this site sort of ticks off those boxes. How would it cater to the rural community? So, sorry, what I meant there was that under the current secondary plan policies, the industrial uses are to cater to the rural, to, to the rural economy. What this application does is not strip that away, but it adds to it to allow for a greater range of industrial uses, not just those that are, um, are catering to the local community. So it's, it's sort of a broadening of the policy. I'm not sure how, um, what you're proposing does that though. It's, it's in the text of the official plan amendment. It's to, to expand the intent of the designation to not only allow rural industrial uses, but to allow a larger range of industrial uses that require access to the 416. Okay. When you look for a site, do you uh, evaluate the transportation network around it and uh, the, how you would accommodate a workforce? 
Um, yes, and w with the application for this, we submitted a traffic impact assessment as part of the part of the application. It was submitted together with the uh, conceptual servicing information um, and, and a host of other studies that were intended to assist with establishing the principle of development. They don't get to the level of detail that everybody's asking about because that's for site plan approval. So we do look at the site in proximity to what um, what transportation routes are nearby, what kind of development is nearby, what are the land use designations in place today. So there's a whole myriad of things we look at as planners in determining the suitability of a site. So would everybody who's spoken out in, uh, against this proposal today, are, are they being premature in, in their assessment of this plan? I think that what people are asking about are all legitimate interests. They all are things that anybody would be wondering in terms of how is my water going to be affected and traffic and all those things we've heard about, those are all legitimate. Um, but what we're saying is that the details of that will come at the site plan stage. And as I said at the outset today, it's not uncommon at all to apply for official plan and zoning bylaw amendments um, with a sort of limited amount of information to establish the principle of development and then the details provided at the site plan stage. That's when the information is necessary to make sure that mitigation can be implemented appropriately for the context. Can you understand how today they are not going to, uh, the people who are still here today will not be happy knowing that, uh, that the plan that you're actually proposing is not as even as fleshed out as they have been led to believe and we want to approve this and then, then go to site plan. Um, I'm just, I, I'm not sitting in the audience, but I'm, I'm questioning how comfortable I would be if we just did, we did that and we weren't sure exactly what's going to go to the site plan next. That's all. I'm, am I, anyway. That, I'll, I'll be, no, I'm not looking to pay. Stop, please, please, please stop. Um, I just, I, it's a question I have as a, as a committee member. How confident should I be if I vote to approve the amendments today that, that uh, the site plan, it's not going to be even, grand, like the proposal won't even be grander than what you're proposing, like what they think you're proposing currently. So mm -hmm. holding provision, I do that. Councillor, well, no, don't answer that. Okay. So, Councillor, you heard us earlier say we have a holding provision on the application. So that means nothing will be approved, no building permit will be able to issue before they meet the conditions of the site plan approval and the community will have an opportunity to talk to our counselor of the area and try to mitigate the impact of this application. So that's on the site plan, it's not for today. Today, what these people are proposing, an official plan amendment and zone change. That's what we need to focus our question about. And you'll be more than welcome to get involved with the site plan application when we see all the condition and making sure all those conditions are met and then we can remove the, uh, the holding provision lines. My apologies, I'm still learning this. Thank you. Just quickly on that, just to respond, I know it's odd to respond to the counselor, but <clears throat> the point of the holding provision is that I won't support a significant deviation from what the concept plan has been. Because we started this with a concept plan, and if okay. anything comes specifically against what that is, that's not something I would be supportive of. And that's where the point of the holding provision is, because it gives me that extra control. That's right. Anyway, but, uh, uh, we'll start. thank you, Councillor Meehan. Councillor Duruz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. You articulated very well. I just a quick question around the traffic, which is not going into the de detail of the site plan. But usually, the, when, you, when you put your study and you put the application, uh, the supported document that you put, this is gener general. Uh, in case of the site was built for that capacity, you use the maximum number of cars and uh, traffic. Is that something correct, on the, I'm assuming? I won't pe pretend to be a traffic engineer, um, but it was prepared um, by a qualified um, traffic engineering team and reviewed and under review by the city. Um, Given the proximity of the site to the to the 416, um, MTO would be quite extensively involved in in any um, analysis of of a tra of traffic design because um, they take traffic of you know you know very seriously. So um, I can assure you that uh, any approval of site plan approval will also require MTO agreement to that. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
One, before we go to Councillor Moffitt, um, when, you are, when you are in a close proximity to a highway development, MTO is involved with, that, with, the, with the traffic study. Am I correct on this? Yes. Okay. So any other question for the proponent? Well, Mr. Beach and Mr. Pence, thank you very much for being here and speaking on. Okay. You've, you've submitted an application to the MTO and you're currently working with the MTO, correct? Correct. That's what We've, we haven't submitted an application, but we have started a process to uh, start reviewing the corridor, uh, reviewing from an EA perspective uh, the areas that would require modifications in order to support uh, a development um, as per our concept plan. And yes. you're using the comments from the previous meeting to help feed into that? Correct. We've just started that process uh, two, two weeks ago. But any, any development close to, to a highway city, MTO is involved, right? M According yes, to the uh, highway traffic. Act. Correct. The fact okay. that the property fronts the MTO, they okay. are involved in all levels of design. And okay. approval. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you both gentlemen. For... So now our question to staff. Sorry, from what we heard earlier from the delegation. First of all, I'd like to begin a sincere thank you to, to the resident who made the, the trip today to, to this building. I really want to thank you for uh, your articulated to, uh, to, to your points. And uh, I, I, hope, I hope we made it clear, even with the help of legal, to, to define what we are dealing with today versus what the community brought to us. So we heard you loud and clear. You're on record with your opposition, whether to a groundwater, to a traffic, to to uh, to uh, rural, all those area. Can you please? We didn't interrupt you when you were speaking, so please. So we heard you about this. Now, what on the front of us is an application for OP amendment, and that's what I would like to ask my colleague to focus their question to staff. About, uh, about the application from that perspective. Okay, so, Councillor Gower, Mr. Vice Chair. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the slide that was up at the very beginning showing the height and the grade, I don't know if you can put that back up if it's still available. Because when I first read the report that's in front of us, I made a note, how did you arrive at 22 meters and how does that make sense? I just, I want to, if you don't mind, just go through that again. So I think it's important to understanding why you are recommending 22 meters versus the 30 that the applicant has brought or the, the uh, 15 that's in the current provision. So, <clears throat> excuse me, the slide on in front of you. So what this shows is, let's, let's look at the red hatched areas. So today, as of right, someone could build 15 meters high on the existing grade. When you look at the proposed rezoning for 22 meters, what that shows is um, an elevation change with respect to the grading that probably will most likely have to be undertaken on the site. So in terms of trying to rationalize that difference, we're looking at that. And again, this is, this is the concept. There's, no, there's nothing uh, accurate here at this point, and we'll receive this information as part of the site plan application. Um, again, so we know there's going to be a grade differential. It could be three meters. It could be five meters. Again, that's part of the engineering aspect of this. So, we're, we're confident that um, the, the, the increase in height to 22 meters will, won't be that much more of an impact than what they could do today at 15 meters. So the, the, not much of a visual impact compared to what the current zoning allows. Correct. And this is based on the concept that Broccolini has provided. This is, this is the drawing they've provided us in terms of trying to help us think through this process on how, how the building is going to be arranged on, on the site. 
Okay. Uh, one of the delegations made a comment about how, well, first of all, I think we need to acknowledge this idea of a, a mega warehouse for shipping or Amazon. We don't know for sure. Assuming that it is an Amazon-like warehouse. A delegation mentioned that definition of warehouse as it might have been 10 or 15 or 20 years ago may be very different from how we're thinking about warehouses now. What is the definition of a warehouse now? Has it changed since the existing zoning was put in place? Okay. So in terms of the business, of course, that model has changed. We didn't have e-business type warehouses back 20, 25 years ago. But, but the definition of warehouse hasn't changed. We're still, we still have the same definition in our bylaw today. And it states, warehouse means a building used for the storage and distribution of goods and equipment, including self-storage units, mini warehouses, and may include one accessory dwelling unit. So that, that's always been the definition for a warehouse in our bylaw. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll stop there and I'll let my colleagues uh, ask, ask some more questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Question to staff with council. I'm getting the impression that I have to wait till the site plan. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I can bring if, it back if you. <laughs> I real actually, no, um, I have too many questions I think to ask. So um, um, no, I guess I don't. Um, I don't know if they if, if they're legitimate. Sorry. Questions. I'm sorry. I don't understand. That's okay. Uh, okay, Councilor De Roos. Thank you, Chair. I don't know. I, I won't go into the, the, the detail of the site plan. Um, just a quick question on uh, official plan and on the zoning. What the difference between that site and the site was just proposed in in my ward that was already built without without even going for that process, which is I was. I was uh, just all of a sudden start being uh, built in my back in the community. Oh, no, he's talking about Amazon. You know exactly what I'm talking about. That site uh, that you're speaking to um, at the corner of Mitch Owens and Boundary Road, I believe, uh, was already zoned for that purpose. So they went immediately to site plan approval where issues such as traffic, uh, servicing, stormwater management, so on, were addressed through the site plan approval process. What what the difference between so this uh, this site right now they can could, they can do the same on half of it is it and, I, and portions just of just for the committee's and, uh, information that's that's correct um, there's portions of the site that are already zoned for this type of activity that could proceed directly to site plan approval if there wasn't a zoning bylaw amendment needed as the proponent has described they're looking for some amendments to the uh, zoning bylaw to allow uh, some flexibility in what they intend to do. But you are correct in that a warehouse could be built on this site by going directly through site plan approval without going through the, uh, the ARAC committee. Thank you. Are you done? Yeah. If you want to, by all means, if you. Okay. Uh, it seems uh, quite a bit of uh, confusion about what's allowed on the site today. So let's see if we didn't have an application today and the zoning from 1997 on the front of us today, what they will be allowed to do. Can you bring up the uh, useless thing? I know. No, but Sorry, I thought we could. Um, we don't have the English version on, on the laptop. So in terms of, and there's a whole. You may recall the slide um, I had up. There's there's a whole list of uses. Some of them are comparable in each in each zone in each zone. So, I guess to in in short, Mr. Chair, um, both zones permit a warehouse. The general industrial zone, and as you work back to the secondary plan, provides only for warehouses that are firm, or benefit to the firming activity. The highway commercial zone, which also allows the warehouse, 
is for the traveling public and business activity. So on that particular zone, and I think that was the question the council had asked, you could build a warehouse today on that zone based on this proposal. It's a smaller area, of course, but that is currently permitted in the, in the highway commercial zone. The amendments that we're seeking really is to, and I don't want to use the word tweak, uh, is to amend the plan without changing the, the content. We want the original content to remain in the plan, the farm benefiting aspect, but we're adding this local and regional use in order to provide that, that provision for a, a warehouse, which is currently being proposed. So that's, that's the difference in the two zones. Many of the uses are similar, as you, as, I'm sorry if we can't bring it up on the slide, but they are comparable, the highway commercial uses and the industrial uses. The industrial uses do speak to a little heavier application in terms of manufacturing and so on, but outside that, they're, they're comparable. Thank you for that, Mr. Astafichak. Another concern I heard, and I think is uh, something for our uh, clerk staff or legal to look at it in the future, because we're making change to the official plan. And so when we talk about the rural area and we say the notification should go, and this is under the Planning Act. I'm not saying you guys doing something separately, but the plan Act said 150 meter or, two, two, or, or 200, whatever. 120, oh, okay. So we all know in a rural area that's really is nothing. In order to go get a bag of milk, you have to drive 20 minutes. So uh, is there something we can do our own as a rural committee when we have something of this magnitude or application, it, it'll have a larger impact to notify further than the 120 meter. I know 120 meter, this is the planning act you have to do, but can we do over, like I know with today's technology, Facebook has more power than all your notification, no disrespect to yours, but, so how could we make it more informative to the resident to know about this? And it's not just for North Gore, actually, I'm talking about right across the rural area. Mr. Chair, a good point. This came up at our information meeting, of course, and. We, um, as aside from the Planning Act, we have the uh, Council-approved public consultation guidelines. I get that. So I'll go through that quickly. So we post signs on the site. We circulate within 120 meters. We give a heads up to the councillor, the ward councillor. We give a heads up to the community association. Typically, the councillor will put this in his newsletter, and this again, that 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 circulation kind of gets moving and. It's something we heard at the information meeting. We've, we have taken, I think we, we've taken it back and discussed a bit of it in our office, but I believe it's something that we would have to, and, and legal may correct me, but it's something we'd have to go back into our consultation guidelines and, and build on that and do a circulation of 300 meters or, or provide another practice of in, involving the public. Well, maybe not so much for today, but I think I would follow up with uh, with legal and Andrea, and we're trying to do something. We heard time and time again about this. With notification for 120 meter is not sufficient in the rural area, and I like to see something change. And even if it means we have to do something over and above the requirement, I think we should do that. Uh, so, to go back to to what we have on the front of us today. So we have the uh, the application and we have the motion from Councillor Moffitt. So, so item number one, the Agricultural Rural Affairs Committee recommend Council adopt an official plan amendment to volume two North Gore secondary plan, which modify schedule one attached in document three redesignating a portion of the land delineated of, uh, by shading. Do you mind first? Oh, you haven't done yet? Okay, okay, we can do that. Go ahead. You mine, mine amends the oh, you amended it. Okay, you want to introduce it again? Go ahead. You have the motion? Yeah. I gave it away. You have the motion. Okay. Sorry, I'm moving it right now. No, no, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. 
Okay. So this is just uh, this motion replaces the. Yeah, so therefore, be it resolved that document one, location map, be replaced with the attached map to incorporate an open space buffer of 100 meters from the residential property lines to the west. And be it further resolved that document two details recommended zoning report in its entirety be amended to replace the following text. Document two details recommended zoning, the proposed change to the City of Ottawa zoning bylaw 2008 250 for 1996, 1966, sorry, Roger Stevens Drive. One, rezone the lands shown in document one as follows. A, area A from RC to RG with the holding provision. B, area B to RC, 55R to RG, exception with the holding provision. C, area C, sorry, area C from RG to RG, exception with the holding provision. And D, area D from RG to 01, open space. Uh, two, add a new exception, RG, to section 240, rural exceptions with provisions similar to the intent of the following. A, in column two, applicable zones, add text RG exception with the holding provision. B, in column two, additional land uses permitted in the following, and the following, bed and breakfast, daycare, park, recreational and athletic facility, retail store limited to an antique store, craft shop, and farmer's market. C, in column four, land uses prohibited, add the following text, storage yard, waste processing and transfer facility. D, in column five, provisions add the following text. The holding provision, the holding symbol may only be removed following the approval of a site plan control application. Maximum height 22 meters, maximum total volume of all buildings, 1,914,035 cubic meters. Be it further resolved, there be no further notice pursuant to subsection 3417 of the Planning Act. So, Madam Clerk, with the adoption of the motion from Councillor Moffat? Yeah. Oh, legal. Oh, legal, sorry. <laughs> okay, we'll start again. Madam uh, Inta, legal staff. So with the adoption of Councillor Moffat motion, so that mean we'll amend the report as written, is that correct? That is correct, Mr. Chair. So what we need to do, vote on the motion first and uh, then carry the report as amended. That's correct, Mr. Chair. Okay, do you want to speak about it? Anybody speaking about the no. Any council wish to speak about the motion? It's been introduced earlier. Councilor uh, Governor, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I think the councilor's motion addresses certainly not every resident concern, but the most significant ones. Moving to a 100 meter buffer zone, for example, on the east side is almost, oh, sorry, on the west side, west thank side. you, is almost unprecedented in terms of the buffer area. Um, and the holding provision, as we've heard from Councillor Moffat, um, allows the councillor and city staff to make sure that the issues that have been brought up here, some very significant issues, can be addressed before there's any zoning approval. So I'll be supporting Councillor Moffat's motion. Sorry, any other uh, on the motion? So on the motion, we'll have A's and A's, Mr. Councillor DeRuz. Yes. Councillor Moffat. Yes. Councillor Meehan. No. Councillor Gower. Yes. Councillor Elshantiri. Yes. Four yeas, one nay. Okay, so again. Now on the report as amended with Councillor Moffat's motion. Do we need A's and A's or we can carry the item? Same vote. It's the same vote? Or oh. So just carried against me as dissent. Councillor Meehan, are you dissenting on the report as amended? Okay, so it's the same uh, vote. Okay. Okay, so. Uh, with, I believe with that, that will be conclude our agenda. We don't have anything item. Uh, we have no speaker for the open mic session, and we have any notes of motion for next meeting? No inquiries, other business, adjournment. Okay, thank you.
we may not have the meeting on the 16th because it was only the one item, so we may 